five assists, good for his 11th career postseason with 25 and five. Welcome back into our NBA TV studios. I'm Kristen Ledlow, and this is Playoff Central Live, presented by AT&T 5G. I'm also going to be joined by our Jim Jackson and the Hall of Famer, Kevin McHale. But for now, let's listen to a little bit more on this matchup, starting with Bam Adebayo, whose block sealed that Game 1 win. My emotions was everywhere, but everybody else around me was happy. And uh, this is one of those things, you, it doesn't hit you until the game's over. When it happened, I was looking at the clock like we still got time. Like, just go ahead and close it out. And we did that. But after that, celebrated and then, you know, we're focused on the next one. And that's what it takes to win championships. Defense like that, it sealed the game for us. Um, and I think that what Bam did to, to save that game and to to make sure that we win it by putting his body on the line, that, that really is a, a really great play. His competitive maturity belies his age, and that's what we've always loved about Bam. It's, it's about winning, uh, and it, that's all he thinks about is how to impact winning in all the ways uh, that you know a staff and organization uh, would see it. And he has that maturity to understand it is only one game. I guess it's disappointing you never want to lose a game, uh, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, best of seven, so. Just get ready for game two. It is what it is. It's exactly how we expected it. You know, uh, it was a great game. Two great teams. Uh, you know, who played really hard. You know, uh, they got the plays at the end that, that mattered. And, you know, they did their job. And it's up to us to come back game two and do ours. I think we learned about us, too. You know, at times we, you know, let go of the rope. We had a pretty good lead. Um, and we maybe got away from some of the things that led us to that lead. I feel like we'll, we'll get back to playing Celtic basketball. So for more on Game 2, our Rebecca Harlow is in Orlando covering games for NBA TV and TNT and doing an excellent job. Rebecca, apart from what we just heard from the Celtics, what have they communicated about necessary adjustments in Game 2? Yeah, well, Kristen, you could hear the frustration there from the Celtics because they felt like they had out played this Heat team for the majority of the game. So to lose, that was really tough. But they're circling two things that they really want to change tonight. The first is transition defense, according to Brad Stevens. Talking to him, he said giving up 16 fast break points to this Heat team is completely unacceptable, especially when you consider that there are about nine guys on that roster that can score and score quickly, that they can't give up those easy layups in the fourth quarter. But Here's the other thing that they are looking to do tonight differently on the Boston side. They feel like they need to do a better job keeping their emotions in check. Stevens has talked about this on this entire playoff run, that the guys have to make sure that if they're upset by a call or if they're upset that they've missed a shot, that they can't let that affect the defense on the end of the floor, that they still need to get back because it's a missed opportunity to make the next right play. So look for that focus and intensity from Boston tonight, Kristen. The Heat, though, did go on to win the game. But when I look at the box score breakdown, I'm seeing inconsistency from quarter to quarter. What led to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was wild watching that game because it was like watching two different teams from one quarter to the next. And as you can imagine, the Heat aren't happy about it. And they were definitely frustrated that they couldn't find that consistency. And so for them, they feel like it comes down to the fact that they didn't play with purpose enough that there were times where they weren't cutting hard enough, they weren't moving fast enough, and they weren't just giving that all-out effort that it requires to be consistent in a playoff scenario. We do, though, talk, Rebecca, often about heat culture. We hear it so often, but they talk about it. What, though, have you observed about this team, about their chemistry since covering them? Yes. Well, Kristen, what is so impressive to me about this Heat team is the fact that there were so many new faces coming in this year, yet they clicked so incredibly quickly. And down here in the bubble, you really feel that. You get a sense for that. I had a conversation with someone inside of the organization who's been with the Heat for a very, very long time. And he said of all of the teams that he's been through, he feels like this team clicked 
the fastest and that they just all truly love each other. They get along. And the example that he used is, say there's an optional team dinner. Everybody shows up because they want to. They're putting in the work and they're staying together. Of course, that all starts with Jimmy Butler. We've seen him time and again take over games when he needs to. But he's also got a new career high in assist this year. And something that he's really focused on is making sure that he gets his teammates going, especially early in games. And when they play together like that and when they're just really, truly enjoying this run together, you really see it pay off out there on the floor. Yeah, new career high, but also like a new career. He's, is he, he's creating coffee mm -hmm, yes. in his room to sell to his teammates. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, at $20 a pop, Kristen. So, you know, I actually would probably, if I was allowed on that side of campus, I would go over there to buy a coffee from Jimmy Butler, but that's not in my future. Well, whatever it is, I would like some of that. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking yes. the time. You are wearing the mask proudly and with style. It's great to see you. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Kristen. All right, we bring in now our Hall of Famer, Coach Kevin McHale. Coach, let's start a little bit talking about the Heat first, and then we'll get to the Celtics. As Jimmy Butler joined LeBron James and Luka Doncic as the only players to make multiple go-ahead shots in the final 24 seconds of either the fourth quarter or the overtime period, how important, when you're looking for a clutch go-to player in those kind of final stretches, can a guy like that be? Oh, that's huge. I mean, you're going to have to make some shots. Look, these are You don't get to the conference finals and play a poor team. That team has won two series, and they're going to you know, come in there. And you have to have guys that can finish. I mean, Butler is one of those guys that that under under pressure, you know, beautiful passer. I love that little action, the give and go. But what he can do is that under pressure, he can get his own shot off. And he made that tough three in the corner. He had a hard driving layup in there late in the games and stuff. So, you know, they have a guy that, that can go and get you baskets and you have to have that. But the thing I liked about them is the ball swung around. Jay Crowder was getting shots. Hero's getting shots. Everybody's getting shots on that team, not just Jimmy Butler, but they do have a closer. And when you have a closer, man, you have a lot of confidence. And it was Goran Dragic as well. You mentioned the other guys, yes. but he had a postseason I'm high sorry, 29 yeah. points in game one. What made him so effective? How did I forget Goran Dragic? Thank you, Chris. <laughs> right? For <reminding> yeah. me. <laughs> um, <laughs> he does it so no, quietly. He, he was great. Yeah. I, I coached, I coached Gordon, uh, I, 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 Gordon in Houston, and what a great young man he is. I mean, this guy plays hard all the time. But what he was doing, he was taking the fight to the Celtics. He was coming off pick and roll, going downhill, weaving through, getting out in the break. He's got little float game. You know, he's left-handed. You know, left-handed guys are always crafty. And um, he gets in the paint. But I, he just put pressure on them all the time. Had a great game. And I thought he was the catalyst, not catalyst for that team winning that. And what the, what the Heat did is they hung around versus the Celtics and eventually just hanging around, hanging around, got into overtime and finally took control of the game. But they hung around a lot because of uh, Goran Dragic. But again, everybody had a, had a big part to play. Crowder, Hero, every, everybody played well for that team. And it wasn't just offensively, but defensively as well, because it was Bam Adebayo's block that essentially yeah. sealed the game for as much confidence as it takes for Jason Tatum to go up and try and throw it down to win the game. It takes, I would imagine, that same level of confidence to go up and try and block it, right? Yeah, you got to attack the shooter. I mean, right now, Bam, Bam comes over. He gets to, well, look, look at the big step he has. He's oh. in help side, but he comes over, and I mean, he comes over from outside of the paint, on the left side to block that shot. And he's got, cause, but you got to beat that force. Cause I'll tell you right now, Tatum was going up to throw that down. And you know, I've, I've blocked a few dunks in my days. And I tell you what, there's a lot of pressure. His hand was damn near in the rim. Yeah. I mean, his, his, uh, his wrist got bent Ooh. down and there's a lot, you know, you go up and you've got to go up with force. So if you're standing there and don't have momentum taking you to the play, you get dunked on, but he had his momentum. What a beautiful time to block. And uh, you know, I give, I give him a lot of courage. There's a lot of guys that wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. Would have saw Tatum hit the line. Yeah. posterized at <laughs> yeah. that point they, and that's what i'll always tell people is that you know, with championship teams they're not worried about that stuff posterizing this they're like man i got to get a stop and I, I love that kid he's he's a fearless uh competitor always protecting the rim which brings me one thing i say really quickly about the celtics they got to drive more they got to attack bam because bam's going to help all the time and then find people because he's constantly in that paint protecting that paint and they never collapsed the heat and they were almost like they were afraid of bam 
in there protecting the rim. you got to challenge those big shot blockers. Let's talk a little bit more about the Celtics because they did have a 12-point lead going into the fourth quarter. Could you break down some of what you saw for me? Well, break down in those late-game stretches. Yeah, you know, I just thought that that Boston got very passive. Their offense just almost stayed completely on the perimeter. And, you know, if you see here right now, you're coming off. You got everybody. You, got, you have good spacing, but now you got to attack. I mean, at a certain point, the ball never gets past the three-point line on that thing. At that point, someone's got to break the seam. And again, you're going to see nice spacing. That ball has got to. That ball has got to get into the paint. And you've got to attack. All you know there. And you're going to see again here um, as the ball comes around and, and the attack. Long jump shot. Ball never got inside the three-point line. And you, you, you've got to be able to attack. Like I say, watch, watch the Heat's defense, which is very good. They're all matched up. But every man is just keeping his man in front of him. And there's really no uh, no breakdowns, no room to get in. But someone's got to beat their man off the dribble. And I think there was just way too much stagnant dribbling on top, which you see there. And just, you know, kind of getting in there a turnover. And when you do break down the defenses, you're going to see them do it here to play. Um, you've got to really attack. So again, ball's coming out. You get over here. Look at this. Now you got to make the right plays. They, they they collapse. They do a good job of collapsing. But you got to force that. You can't allow one guy to guard his man head up. Everybody else is in help position. Everybody's just you know big and, and, and showing their arms and, and closing down space. But they've got to. Uh, They've got to break people down and draw and kick. And as I said earlier, you know, you've got to attack Bam because that brings in Williams and Tice. Because when the big guy comes over to um, to shot block, as Bam will, you've got to drop that off to Tice or Williams. Or you can make somebody cover down. So when the cover down comes from the, uh, either the weak side corner or, 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 the, uh, or the slot. and then uh, We can do something. Are you going to say something? <laughs> Go ahead, bro. 6-0 in elimination games here in the bubble. As the Denver Nuggets are going back to the Western Conference Finals for the first time in 11 years. I've never been around a team like this, man. For real. Inspirational group. Love all y'all, man. We, we got work to do. Wow, the Denver Nuggets have now tied a record previously set by the franchise in 1994 with six wins in a single postseason while facing elimination. The Miami Heat, Houston Rockets, and Phoenix Suns all also did it in the 90s. But for now, here's more on game one of the Western Conference Finals from the coaches and players, starting with Mike Malone on the challenge ahead. We still have a lot of work to do. Western Conference Finals, we know we're playing a very talented and well-rested Laker team. Uh, but I do know this, our guys are up for that challenge. We know what we got. And uh, when we're all clicking, we're all, when we're making shots like that and playing defense together, you know, we're, we're a top four team, top three team in the league. And uh, we're trying to prove to be the number one. We've been doing this. I don't know how many times you know, we got to prove it over. You know, we've, we've been doing this and we have the talent to do it. The confidence that they're playing with, the chip on their shoulder uh, that they're playing with uh, was really noticeable. Obviously, they're a very resilient group. Uh, to come back from 3-1 twice in the same year. And we're going to have to play great to beat them. They have a lot of fight. Um, they don't really quit. They're always you know, trying to play to win, uh, no matter if they're down 19, which they were in uh, game five and six, still coming back to win it. So uh, it kind of just tells you the story of what kind of part that team has. Obviously, I have the utmost respect for LeBron James. I had a chance to coach him for five years, know who he is and what he's about. And I'm sure he was watching every one of our games, taking notes because his intelligence is off uh, the charts. Yeah, Joker is uh, one of the most unique players in the world and one of the most unique players ever to play the center position uh, in this league. They understand his ability to pass in the basketball and, and do a great job speed cutting through the lane. And uh, it can make it very difficult to guard. Uh, it, it does... Uh, you know, make this series a little different, a lot different actually than last series. Obviously, um, you know, we're going to be the LA Lakers, uh, who we've been all, all year. You know, we adjusted to a small ball team last series, but, you know, I would expect us to return to form. And Jim, we just heard Frank Vogel call Nikola Jokic one of the most unique players in the entire world. He affects the game in so many ways, but his passing may be his most impressive skill. What did you see from him in Game 7 against the Clippers as far as being a facilitator goes? 
Well, you know, really, it started back, I think, at the beginning of the series, understanding how the Clippers were guarding him. Just a simple handoff right here. But again, the patience to understand where the defense is at, but more importantly, where the cutters, his teammates would be. Not rushing here in transition, able to push the ball up. And then it looked simple, but that bounce pass on the move, on time, on target is difficult. A little back down right here. Again, always surveying the defense. He has two options here. He sees Kawhi coming. Okay, yeah. The cutter, Jeremy Grant, provides a release and understanding that Gary Harris is going to fill the lane in there. And then again, inside, identifying where the defense and where this Denver Nuggets team, I think, really helps the Kola Jokic is their ability to cut and read the defense themselves. And this is a tough pass. Leads right to the basket inside. And if you're a player, listen, I play with our Venus Sabonis, one of the best passing centers ever. Vladi Divac and also Chris Webber. One thing I took pride in is making myself available to those guys to be able to get easy layups. Again, you have to be unselfish. Jokic didn't shoot the ball particularly well from the field, but his ability to survey, to be patient, to put the ball out there on time so guys can just finish, it makes it a lot more complicated to take all of the things away from Nikola because even when he's not effective putting the ball in the rim, as we saw through that film right there, he can beat you off the dribble as well. I mean, off the pass as well as anybody. Because, Coach, the Nuggets now have essentially rewritten NBA history with not one but two comebacks from a 3-1 deficit in back-to-back playoff series. Are we all collectively underestimating what they could achieve against the top-seeded Lakers? Well, I had them under- underestimated twice when they were down 3-1 in each series. <laughs> so, I said, yes. on. Yeah. And uh, they came back. <laughs> And play so yeah, I guess we are all underestimating them. You know, I mean, I just I looked at them. I thought the Clippers just had their number and they just fought back. Um, Jimmy made a good point. You know, when 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 you have good passing teams, and I was really fortunate to play on some really really tremendous passing teams. All your cuts are rewarded. Every time you make a good cut and you do different things, it's rewarded with a nice pass. And what happens? It's so hard to guard. Um, uh, Denver because everybody's cutting and everybody's moving because they know it's going to come back to him. And this guy right here, Murray's been on fire. He took a little hiatus after he went crazy against Utah for a few <laughs> games, but then he came back and he, I mean, he's, his ability to make shots for himself and create shots for himself. We talked about it earlier, Kristen. You have to have those guys that can get their own shot. We talked about Jimmy Butler uh, with Miami, but he can get his own, but they don't need to get their own. I, you know, when you talk about them playing the Clippers and what happened in Game 7, they were getting layups and little lead passes for just lay-ins and dunks and wide-open shots off of Jokic's passing. And everything that the Clippers got was contested. And everything was a hand in their face. There wasn't as much movement from the Clippers as it was from Denver. So, yes, we have underestimated this team. But it's a fun team to watch. And they're going to go against a very, very good defensive unit in the Lakers. And it's going to really stress this team. And they're going to have to be on top of their game to beat the Lakers for sure. Well, we're going to take another break. But we are with you until tip-off between the Boston Celtics and Miami Heat in Game 2 of this Eastern Conference Final with the Heat holding the 1-0 lead. Playoff Central Live continues next the Eastern Conference Finals to take the 1-0 lead. But first, we're looking ahead to the Western Conference Finals. Calvin Booth currently serving as the general manager of the Denver Nuggets. Here's a look at his bio as he was named GM in July and played in 366 games over his 10-year NBA career starting in 1999. So for more on the Western Conference Finals and the Nuggets run thus far, we welcome in Calvin. And the Nuggets... I think have seemed to surprise everybody except for themselves. What is it, Calvin, about this team that has been its best when it plays from behind? It's been the story of the past three seasons for us. Uh, You know, a couple of seasons ago, we had to play, win six straight games to play that elimination game against Minnesota, (laughs) which we came up short in. And, you know, last year we played in two seven-game series. And so uh, I think it's just the fabric of who we are. I have a two, two part question to just Jimmy Jackson. Um, one, how much did last year's loss, especially in, against Portland, the maturity part of it this year, play into being able to advance this year? And also the closeness of this group, in particular when times are tough, <laughs> tend to draw together. How did that how did that also play a role into advancing to the Western Conference Finals? 
Sorry, I had uh, trouble hearing you, Jim. I didn't, I didn't hear the question. <laughs> and of course, it's a two-part one, one always. Out. Yeah. You just blocked me. This is an Ohio thing. Me and you, Calvin. Come on, man. <laughs> okay, but look, last year's disappointment in the playoffs, especially losing to Portland, the team matured. How much did that play into this year's advance? But also, the closeness of this team, when things got tough, they were able to band together. So how did those two factors play into getting finally back to what's your conference run? Yeah, I think you always learn a lot from your losses. And uh, the Portland game was particularly tough because we had a big lead in that game and just didn't make enough shots. And uh, they had some great performances from C.J. McCollum. Evan Turner came off the bench and, and made some big plays. And uh, we, they just beat us and they, and they closed out. So I think this year we're a little bit more focused and trying to be sharp and uh, understanding that we had to make shots against the Clippers if we wanted to close them out. So I think uh, to your second part, it's just this group uh, has a toughness to them, you know, that that uh, just gets them through hard times. You know, we, we got Mill, Millsap a couple of years ago as a free agent, uh, Nicole and Jamal grown up, uh, Gary, Will Barton. We've added Jeremy Grant to the group, even guys off the bench like Mason Plumley and Tory Craig and Monte Morris. They all have that tough gene and, and they're winners. Yeah, Kelvin, you mentioned him, uh, Paul Millsap. I thought the whole series changed in game five and he kind of went nose to nose with Morris and uh, just said, hey, let's go. You know, we're not going to be, we're not backing down. We're, we're going to fight you for it. And how big is it to have a guy like Millsap, who's a veteran, around so many young guys because you really have a young crew? I mean, he's really set the tone for us uh, defensively more than anything over the last couple of seasons. Uh, he's a guy that leads by example. He's not going to say a lot, but the guys, when he does talk, they listen because uh, they, they know his body of work. They know he has credibility around the league. And how often, Calvin, are we underrating Nikola Jokic when we have these conversations about the best of the best in the NBA? Hey, look, uh, you know, the all-NBA team just came out, and uh, there's so many good players in the league. You look at that second team, you're like, geez, man, like a lot of these guys seem like they should be on the first team. But then you look at the first team, you're like, well, who would you take off? And so I, I just think the talent in the league is going up. And I think people appreciate how good Nicola is. And I, as every series passes, they're, they're getting more appreciation. But it's just a league that's loaded with talent. And uh, I felt like Nicola performed like a first-team All-NBA player this year. But unfortunately, there are just a lot of good players that, play, that deserve to be on the first team. Calvin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We have actually seen your schedule, and it is busier than any of ours. So thanks for fitting it in. <laughs> Oh, no problem. No problem. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Now, in other NBA news, let's take a look at the personnel changes within the Sacramento Kings organization as of late. Hiring Monty McNair as general manager after serving as assistant GM of the Houston Rockets. And Joe Dumars has been named chief strategy officer after serving as special advisor to the GM and interim VP of basketball operations. Now, we're with you until tip-off between the Boston Celtics and... Tyler Hero and the Miami Heat in Game 2 of the Eastern Conference Finals with the Heat holding the 1-0 lead. Playoff Central Live continues next. Marcus Smart has hit at least five threes in four games this postseason. By the way, he's the only player in franchise history with more such games. Ray Allen, five times in 2008 and in 2010. Now let's hear from Coach Brad Stevens ahead of Game 2. Hey, Brad, you, you talked a lot about what Jason and Jalen have accomplished at the ages of 22 and 23, respectively. How much do you think of that has been being a part of winning teams and being in the culture that you've created as compared to them being handed over you know, a franchise um, that was not performing as well? Well, I, I think obviously their own personal growth and their teammates have everything to do with it. Culture is not anything that you've achieved traditionally or in your history the culture is the people in the room and everybody doing their job every day as well as they can and so those guys have you know been leaders in that room since the moment they walked in and um, you know for the most part it's been a you know pretty amazing um, path for both of them Abby Chin. Brad, uh, the inevitable Gordon Hayward question. He was upgraded to doubtful, and then you listed him as out tonight. But how's he doing? 
He's out. Um, seems to be doing all right. Uh, and we'll have another update, I'm sure, tomorrow. Keith Smith. Hey, Brad. Um, in, uh, in game one, Miami got an early ball trouble with Duncan Robinson, and they had to come in with Tyler Hero. If you guys had really been defending well until that point, do you think that that early foul trouble actually, in a weird way, may have helped them and threw your guys off a little bit? They've got good players up and down their roster, so when one gets in foul trouble, they can bring in other guys. It can be very impactful. Obviously, Hero is playing at an elite level right now, but Robinson's a guy that we couldn't respect more with his ability to get shots off at tough shots and make shots. So I don't know that there's any advantage gain per se. I think that ultimately um, both those guys are really good players. Tom Westerholm. Hey Brad, uh, Jason Tatum on these two games all NBA yesterday. I'm just curious um, your thoughts and how happy you are. Yeah, I mean, he's had quite a quite a season. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be around now, I think, three All-NBA guys in my time here. And, um, you know, those the seasons that those guys put together are remarkable. And I thought Jason's, you know, ascension as the season went on, his improvement uh, made him well-deserving. Um, and I think that, you know, um, he's just going to keep getting better and better. John Corrales. Right, I know obviously you're just focused on game two, but we still haven't seen a schedule for the rest of the series after game three. Um, how does that impact your pre your preparation? Does that have any impact on the plan for Gordon Hayward? Well, since I didn't even know that until you just said it, I would say that it hasn't impacted my preparation at all. Um, I just figure we're playing every other day, but you know, um, you know, I guess. That'll be determined after the fact. All right, we'll wrap it up right there. Thanks.